name is Matt Abbott. Welcome to this week's Insta session. Uh, I founded Nimson Fugs five years ago and in the lockdown I wasn't really sure how to respond. I'm a bit short on funds so I couldn't really fund a load of new releases. Um, but I decided to do these weekly Insta sessions and it's a lovely way for me to get in touch with poets from around the UK and invite them to do really relaxed performances and have a nice relaxed conversation without the constraints of uh, accessibility and having to fund travel and accommodation. So it's great. I'm absolutely loving it. Um, our next guest is going to be up in a minute, but I just wanted to introduce these sessions and introduce myself. Um, we were off for the last two weeks because the first week um, it was the, the silent day because of Black Lives Matter. Um, and then last week we just didn't feel comfortable doing it either. We just wanted to have a little break to reflect. Um, but now we're back and I'm really, really excited about this session. Um, so today I've got Camille Mahmood. Uh, Camille is a poet from Birmingham. He's a spoken word artist and is a visual artist. Um, he talks about loads of incredibly important themes, including um, masculinity, Islam, international activism, uh, the British Pakistani diaspora, um, and he's a wonderful poet. And his, uh, his his debut collection was published by Verve Poetry Press last year. So I'm very, very lo much looking forward to having him on. Um, so now that I've done my intro, I shall invite him. See if he wants to have a chat. Just wait for it to load up. I'm terrified of technology, me. There we go. Hey, mate, you all right? Hello, you all right? Oh, yeah. my God, the light, the lighting is really bad. Hold on, let me just try and sort it out. It's tough, oh. isn't it? We're all having to be lighting technicians and camera technicians and all that. Oh, there we go. Spot on. Need to just wipe this camera a bit. Just a bit. Nice, nice room. You've got some artwork up. Yeah, um, it's, it's kind of a collection that I've uh, been working on since I was a, kind of a teenager. So I just thought it's, it's been kind of gathering dust behind my bed. So I might as well put it up and have wow. a name to like, add to it every so often. Oh, brilliant. So did you start doing that before you started writing poetry or did they both sort of happen side by side? Or um, Yeah, so it definitely was before. So uh, I've, I've always kind of been a, like visually inclined ever since I was a kid. Um, and I kind of came into writing probably about five, six years ago. So yeah, if anything, I think when I started writing, kind of the visual art side kind of took a back seat. And now it's sort of, I mean, one of the good thing about lockdown is it's allowed us to kind of reevaluate <laughs> some of the things that we're doing um, yeah, yeah. and spend, spend a bit more time just on some of the things that we kind of have missed out on and, and kind of, I, you know, kind of, I, I miss being like a visual artist, but I, you know, I love writing as well. So um, moving forward, I really want to see how I can incorporate that. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, would you illustrate, like, you could almost illustrate your own collection, couldn't you? You could sort of produce a, a, a like, a crossover. Yeah, well, I did, actually. With Mute Men, I illustrated it. Oh, <laughs> I didn't realise I didn't um, that. Sorry. Which was, which was nice. Like, it was, a, it, I always, when I came out with the collection, I was always adamant that I was going to do the illustration. So, yeah. I'm glad that it, I was, allowed, well, was able to do that and had the freedom to do that. Okay. Well, I shall, I shall, I shall purchase a copy uh, as soon as we finish this. Uh, I've obviously seen your stuff online, but I've not got a copy of your collection yet. Sorry, I, my list of books to read is so big; it's, un yeah. it's unreal. Um, Trust me, my, my bookshelf is full of so many books that I haven't read yet. So I've kind of <laughs> made a uh, uh, a goal to not buy any more books until I've at least read a decent chunk of those, because yeah. otherwise I'm just wasting paper. I think. The men Stewart at Verve keeps putting out all these amazing new collections and pamphlets, mm. and it's really difficult to stay away in it yeah, and i always feel like i need to buy them because they're always yeah, really good um and you know it's it's great that the that the, the press has so many writers on it that i admire and you know me coming into writing nafisa was a really really good ins big inspiration amira was a big inspiration casey like pretty much it's kind of like the 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 verb family is like a, it's like family in itself which is great um yeah and yeah, yeah, yeah seems very very supporting as well yeah, 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 definitely. It's about time that Birmingham was in the spotlight, really. Um, yeah, so I'm... tell us about the collection then. How long did it take for you to put it together? Was it quite a fast process or was it years and years? Or um, It was quite a, well, I guess if I compare it to years and years, it was quite quick. <laughs> so I did it within a year. <laughs> right. um, I think I, was, I set myself the target of doing it in six months, but then because um, I'm a dentist, um, uh, I started a job as a, as a MaxVax SHO at Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And that just, just knocked me sideways. Like I really have so much respect for junior doctors because we were just thrown into it. And um, even when the collection came out, I'd started that job. So it kind of um, leading up till that, there was a lot of new things, a lot of distractions, but 
writing, like I always try to make time to, to write and editing, ed you know, you probably know this yourself as a writer, it's, it's the editing that takes longer than the actual writing. Yeah. Um, because you really, you know, once it's in page, you really want it to be as perfect as you, you want, you, you know, you want to be able to look back at it years later and, and, and not cringe at your own work. <laughs> it's a big pressure, yeah. isn't it? It's a big pressure. Yeah. It is a big pressure. Yeah, cool. Well, do you fancy reading us a poem or two from the, yeah. from the collection? Yeah, so I actually, in terms of the set, so I've got a few of my old poems, but I've been writing so much. I mean, you, you know, you probably vouch for this, but I think a lot of writers during this period have been writing because it's sort of, what else can we do? Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm going to do a couple of old pieces, um, old, by old I mean, like, they were written a year ago, so I don't know if it can't yeah. cancel old. Pre-lockdown um, is old. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a brand new world now. Cool. Yeah, so I'll just get into it. So this piece yeah, is called Jolly. Jolly is a uh, Punjabi mimicry for um, uh, netting in curtains. Um, so, yeah. Outside, there is no hint of autumn, just a veering road of cramped terraces, built when Victoria was empress, now home to children she would never own. It affords no room for trees, only the exchange of midday scents of turka, more morning than coffee. Unemployed boys are pendulums stretching their legs, watering tarmac with phlegm. Disputes echo like shunned car alarms. Jarlies flutter, if left out of place, children will be scolded. Who are we to be so brazen, to expose the cleavage of housework attire? Life is a wedding door, blasting uninvited neighbours, death and ambulance, rodent, tales of traffic made to wait. There is me at six asking why we don't go to pubs or how tomato juice tastes. Me at seven asking mum to save for college like in every American movie. Me at eight refusing to walk side by side with bogey girl. Me older, wincing at how young Mrs. Ali's son was, how he would make her breakfast in the morning and vowing never to speed. Me an adult, congratulating him on his dissertation before the manslaughter charge. Me an adult, dulling the corners of my words so they won't cut. It's not fair. More cars than houses. Next door, a cone straddles a disabled spot meant for everyone. But they call the council, so to them it's another extension. The other one double parks. Now dad is waking early to move our car from Stratford Road. Closer, and mum is sending potentials on the family group chat. It seems inane to ask if there will be trees. So yes, yeah, so Nice, I love that. It's my homely piece, so I, yeah. I always feel like when I, when I perform it, I always feel like it reminds me so much of my street. And everyone kind of has their road and the stories that happens in their road and the sense of their road and that familiarity. I think me personally, because I was I was living in London for eight years, so it was is one of those things where you don't kind of appreciate your home surroundings until you've left and then you know have to come back. Yeah, I hear you. Where, whereabouts in London were you? So I was living um, in central London, Borough, London Bridge. The university was at uh, Guy's, Guy's Hospital, right. um, which was quite central. Um, so we were living in Elephant Castle. Um, wow. we were living, yeah, I lived in Tooting for a year as well. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a really great city to live in. I don't know if I'd live there long term, because <laughs> it's just really expensive and busy. Yeah. I need, need a bit of, of quiet to stay sane. Yeah, you definitely appreciate it wave like i'm from west yorkshire and i live in london at the moment and you definitely do appreciate it when you go back there it's yeah but it's yeah like you say it's a great city to live in um yeah anyways sorry enough about me I, uh, do you fancy reading a few more from from the collection yeah. i, I love that yeah. one that was a great opener thank you so okay i'm going to read pedigree um so this is for the families separated at the border by the trump administration and for families in general that are separated by politics labored apologies swept in servitude to lesser men, cogs flicker, strangled by forced words on brown paper passed into soiled laps. Sometimes if the wind is right, you can hear the wrongs of ancestors, stranger to you than presidents of men, pedigree of myth, you a moon in perigee jealous at our lakes, your sin a languished dog, sniffing at the kennel of relevance. I wonder if to you we look the same, despite your tone we send money, despite it all we are perpetual saplings born into deforestation always standing why sit at the table if you won't pass a soul you a floundering body wrinkling for every light burst your graveled accent an untraceable decoy banishing muslims and mexicans like they were no one's child i want to know who loved you before you were born 
and if they tasted bile too. I want to know who loved you before you were born, before freedom, the 16 great grandmothers, unknown sit just past your jugular vein, carrying you in their unfinished prayers like marbles, more sacred than engagement rings, worn like curses, and God, a sorter of sorts, untangles the maelstrom of errant intentions, a path conjured from disorder, again and again, like, like he always has. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So that's our one. Wow. That, um, carry on in your dreams like marbles, that's just phenomenal. Like, yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you, thank you. Do you, um, so I guess do you, you write about activism and uh, international activism and uh, do you ever feel a little bit overwhelmed by it and feel like, because I'm guessing obviously if you are, you are active, like you, you constantly reading the news and keeping up to date on Twitter, do you ever feel like you need to just escape from it for a bit or is it just something that you're constantly looking to write about? Sorry, that's a weird um, question. <laughs> no, I think, I think definitely, um, Firstly, there's so much out there. There's so much crap happening in the world. There's so much that we just don't know, just in terms of like the way we've been educated, the history we've been taught. So in terms of unlearning the, the, the pile of crack, crap that we've learned, um, yeah. it does take energy. And I'm not, I'm not, um, I wouldn't say I'm great at it. I'm tr I try um, and I could probably be better. Um, my, my advice is to find other people who really do know their stuff. Um, in terms of uh, taking a break, I mean, I, personally, I find it difficult to, I don't really like pick a topic and think, oh, let me write about this topic. It's more a case yeah. of there'll be something specific in that topic that makes you reflect on just life and yourself and your place in the world. Um, and for me, I feel like poetry is such a powerful thing um, and such an underrated, uh, such an underrated powerful thing in the sense of the ability to kind of refine words to have that impact. Um, we look at that as you know things like marketing or things that go viral but um the ability to basically just just reflect on kind of current issues and yeah. um, be able to kind of discuss that in a way that is engaging to a lot of people um i think is a, is a gift in a way twitter you know i i chat so much nonsense on twitter but i love twitter <laughs> um i think is you can get like the most up-to-date information from twitter um and i think the more we realize about how um, these mainstream, um, uh, the mainstream media itself is is, is co you know owned by the same same group of people <laughs> who have an agenda. So I feel like as much as Twitter has a lot of um, like trolls on it, and there's a lot of um, uh, uh, white noise as well, um, it, it it offers a great tool to be able to do your own research. And I think we are truly living in an age where we can we can do independent learning. The way we are learning is not by a curriculum. If we yeah. want to go and read a book, we can do that. If we want to go read an essay, we can do that. And there's yeah. plenty of people out that are recommending things. There's plenty of grassroots organizations you can just get in touch with and just be able to speak to people one-on-one -on -one rather yeah. than have to go through emails and that kind of thing. So I do, but, but you know, personally, I do have to take a break from it as well. Um, I find it difficult to, to juggle just life in terms of my career as a dentist, but also creative things and, you know, developing myself as well because i think yeah, that's course. the other thing it's difficult to find time to do that sometimes but it's so necessary if you want to kind of develop that craft it takes a lot of time a lot of and, uh, mental energy a lot of emotional energy so yeah um so poetry in itself is is expressive it can have purpose but at the same time it is it is like a therapy in itself so Ooh. i can use it to relax as well yeah, well, this is sort of where I was coming from, because obviously, like, anybody who writes about anything, you have to take time to develop your craft, and you have to really work at it and stretch yourself and challenge yourself as a writer. But also, if you're trying to educate yourself in terms of, like, unlearning, like you say, when it comes to politics and activism, that's two things that are quite overwhelming. So when you're writing about, when one informs the other, that's, that's what I was getting at, really. That's quite a, yeah. a heavy load for you to carry around. But yeah, but at the, same, yeah. at the same time, I feel, I feel like personally, like I'm doing the bare minimum, and I feel like sometimes the 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 um the idea that you are doing a lot is is something that a lot of people it's it's an outer perspective. But I feel yeah. like if you really if you want to really go for it, like you have to always have the idea that you're not doing enough, because that's the thing that will push you to just try and do more. Because the day that you feel like you've done enough, that's it. You'll just stop. You'll stagnate. You won't yeah. have any motivation to, to, to continue doing that. Um, yeah, 
So personally, I don't think I like there's so many people that I know who are doing incredible stuff. And I just think, wow, like they are admirable. They are doing the stuff. Um, and uh, uh, if anything, like if I can learn from them, that, that's an honor in itself. Um, yeah, there's so much people out there doing great things. And um, yeah, me personally, I don't feel like I'm doing enough. And I feel like we all, we all to a degree are not doing enough. Like we could all be doing more. But well, at yeah. the same time, at the same time, it's not for me to push people to do that. All I can do is do what I think is right. And the other thing is, I feel like just with activism, with just this learning, with poetry, like the heart, at the heart of it has to be, it has to be led by compassion and understanding. But at the same time, you know, you can get angry. Like you're allowed to do that. that yeah, that, of course. Yeah. And you know, you have the artistic license to do that. That's the great thing as well about being a creative. Like you can go out there, you can say what you want and do what you want. Um, and you know, metaphors, Someone taught me, and Nafisa taught me that you can say whatever you want in a metaphor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair. Nafisa's stunning, isn't she? She's such an incredible yeah. poet. Like, she really is. Um, well, I guess that brings us to if you have you got any uh, stuff that you've written recently? Because um, you yeah. know the world has sort of yeah. come to shit quite dramatically in the last few months. Be... I have a few. So I've got uh, I've got a few new ones actually. It's yeah. I'm just I'm not saying I've been churning them out, but for me, like I've. <laughs> if i if i compare myself uh to like say six months ago the rate at which i was writing is just hardly anything compared to just recently and it's in a blessing in itself it's a privilege in itself yeah. that i don't have to worry about about paying the bills in that sense um Amazing. so this one's about this one's about just um kind of the experience of lockdown and just like reflections on thoughts of, um, during lockdown um yeah it's called circles The dining table does not know why its guests sit two meters apart. Elbows stand like television antennas, the relics of an older world. I flick between Naomi Klein's shock doctrine and clips of most shocking Big Brother moments. A fly on the wall, the eye of the storm. The bed is an organ more useful than any appendix. My spine is skipping rope, meandering a purified Thames. Nature is allowed to be noisy now. There's a ghost of that silver goldfish that fell under the same bed 16 years ago, swimming in circles. I dropped its home. A man-made pebbles sprawl like the tide's revenge across the laminar, an afterbirth. But it survived, longer than his name, after he only knew to swim in circles, stirring the water like a baker. Could have been a stroke, might have been the smallness of the tank. It's said an orca's fin flops over when raised in captivity, prostrating to an unseen master. These days, this cage humbles like hunger. I rummage the aisles of this phone's gallery, contemplating if I should upload those holiday snaps from before the planes were grounded. Tiramisu in Rome, a dried fruit stalled in Doyotanon, dim sum dripping into bowls of bog. But who would that bring comfort to? What's an atlas to a mole besides decent bedding, scrapped and stripped? The season's out of sync, or perhaps we are. Perhaps we always have been. Our routines left early like an exit wound. Birds braver than usual, singing their ancient songs, sowing their kernels of truth, while we rest between hibernation, silently embarrassed between metamorphosis, wondering what world will wake to, what circles will be drawn, what circles will be drawn. Nice. <laughs> well, that's really deep, man. That's, that's yeah. If the one good thing that will come out come out of this lockdown is some of the poetry that's been written during it that's yeah. just that's yeah that's beautiful <laughs> i don't really know what else to say other than that it's beautiful um you. have you got any others like that you yeah. from the i've got one oh so i've got like another one actually that is on the topic of not just um not just uh, lockdown but also what's been happening in terms of um with the nhs um, and with just our politics and with with um, Corona itself, not just the side of pandemic, but also kind of the politics behind coronavirus, yeah. um, and just this kind of sinister British performative solidarity that comes with clapping for the NHS and um, yeah, like I wrote this piece and it was kind of it's kind of like my Black Mirror piece. <laughs> when I read of it, I just think of it. This is like a it's kind of Black Mirror. Um, it's called 8, 8 p.m. Uh, It's 7.58 p.m. on a Thursday in the year 2120. A handful of suburbia standing at their doorsteps, waiting to open winter like a present. Some wear wreaths around their necks like Olympic medals. Poppies pinned to their Sunday best. Walking sticks in their left hands. Staffs ready to strike the ground, 
to part their freshly trimmed lawns. 8 p.m. on the dot. An unknown body, proud to pioneer, brings their palms together and apart, too quick to seal a prayer. It starts like rain, dragged to hail, then uproar and cheers. Soon the air is filled with graduations and weddings and birthdays and newborns. Odin raises an eyebrow. The queen nods approvingly. The prime minister, nowhere to be found. Mr. Pavlov's dogs over the road salivate and salvation is found for all who seek it. A boy newer to the world turns to his dad and asks, why are we clapping? His dad shrugs maniacally. I don't know, son, it's just something we do. The boy shrugs back and claps, and claps, and claps. The storm turns to hail, then rain, then puddles. We all nod to each other approvingly. A community of dashboards, smiles, and sighs expelled politely. See you next week, see you next week, see you next week. Echoes from house to house. Doors slam, curtains close, teas are brewed. The street is left empty, as it was before and everyone sleeps easier. That's that one. <laughs> nice. Yeah, but with somebody in the comments there was really keen for you to read that one. I think they're very happy about that. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. Have you been reading that quite a lot? Have I been, sorry, have I been what? Have you been sharing that? Yeah. Um, I've read it, uh, I think I've shared it a couple of times before, um, because I'm trying to get into the habit of, I have this thing where I'll write something and then I won't share it. I'll be like, oh, let me edit it. Let me do this and that. And so, but I'm trying to get into the habit of just sharing it there and then because it's sort of, I find the process of sharing it, you end, it's a lot more helpful when it comes to then editing it because you can actually hear it in your, in your you kind of just reflect on it by hearing on it. Sort of, it's weird. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's a poem, like, a poem's never truly finished until you've performed it or shared it. Yeah. It's weird, isn't it? Is <laughs> like you know when you write spend ages writing a blog post and then you, you publish it and then you read it back and suddenly you're like no <laughs> like change it. it's really weird like but yeah no i get what you're saying and obviously with social media and stuff now it's so easy to publish something and delete it in a few days if needs be like yeah. it's, it's great in it yeah yeah it is it is um i've got two more pieces but i'm just wondering if we've got enough time for them they are yeah, they are relatively i will absolutely um, yeah absolutely so okay, so the, so the next one is um, so this piece is just um, I think for a lot of people as well. So the other thing that's been happening during this time is um, uh, for Muslims, uh, the month of Ramadan happened during lockdown, which is a really like a very strange experience. But I think for a lot of Muslims out there, um, the sort of meditative aspect of being in lockdown, um, kind of uh, like in the last 10, 10 days of Ramadan, you have something called ittikaf, which is where you spend the last ten days in the masjid. So you kind of, it's like a, um, it's a form of lockdown that you willingly go into, <laughs> yeah. but it's kind of like having a whole month of that. Um, so yeah, so um, I, fi I found you in this time just like reflecting on things and kind of reflecting on Islam itself and um, like my relationship with God and spirituality and just, I think one of the amazing things when it comes to just like a connection and spirituality is reflecting on the gifts that we have and reflecting on something as simple as the ability to see color. Um, so this one's called year three colorimetry and inspired by, it's, it's inspired by a verse in the Quran. Um, yeah, it's 30, 22. Um, if you want to research it yourself. <laughs> um, okay. Allah's favorite color must be green and blue. That's the color of the world. In a canteen queue beneath notice boards curating outdated after-school clubs, we pick yesterday's residue from dinner trays, undoing scabs, rewriting histories, and unpaid labour beyond our years, while ankles tempt sprains the price of integrating buckle leather shoes to be grown into. My best friend that year replies, it must be black and gold, those are the colours of the garba, proclaimed with such prophetic certainty, our unfused joints blameless. After 21 years, I type warily, wary of blasphemy. Does Allah have a favorite color? Google and the ulema say there is no consensus. The timeline shares 37 photos of animal eyes viewed so close up you would mistake them for planets. Iris-like marble nebula, landscapes of kaleidoscope, jeweled canyons, a sea of tranquility like celestial vitiligo. I search animals that went extinct in 2019. 
Sumatran rhino, thunder, Chinese paddlefish, stone, Yanks, giant, softshell turtle, lava, Indian cheetah, Tuscan sun, Spix, macaw, Turkish blue, Katerina, pupfish, butter, sangria, steel, Asia, Indo-Chinese tiger, fire. In the shadow of a mirror, I forgive the plainness of my own eye, taught never to turn guests away, a light that traversed the womb of space to find solace in the thankless retina. Cracking the code of hues lit like the murmuration of starlings, all of creation told into the abyss within the hospitality of an eye. If the universe speaks in numbers, it dreams in light. What then is color if not a mercy? What then is God if not the most merciful? That that one? <laughs> Hi. Nice. Wow, it's just the way that your poems just tuck you in and just the imagery and the, it just it's really beautiful to listen oh, thank to. You. Thank really you. So I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of imagery. <laughs> if anyone that I'm speaking to when it comes to poetry, I'm just like imagery, imagery, imagery. It's like my favorite, <laughs> favorite thing. Like I love poets that like oh, just are like about that imagery life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's you do it so well. It's, it's wonderful. And I guess the fact that you're a visual artist obviously has some kind of it obviously influences it to an extent, yeah, but yeah, that's just beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I, love, I love it. I love that. Um, maybe, yeah, perhaps. I, I've never thought of it that way, actually. Um, I have one more. Uh, oh. Do you think we have time for that? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is one that I've written really recently. So um, I don't know if any of the members are on here, but um, I've stopped, I, um, I'm a member of this writing club, which has just started. So it's about six sessions um, every week. And... I, I, it was, I haven't been to that many of these kind of writing sessions, but I've been trying to push myself to do, to just, you know, develop myself during, you know, because you can learn so much from other artists. That's, that's one thing I've learned and other writers. Um, yeah. And I'm just like, it's like I've had a, like a, like a brain explosion <laughs> since, um, since that. So I wrote, I wrote something um, following one of the, um, the recommendations by, by the reading, one of the, the, the reading recommendations. Um, sorry, I'm just going to try and find it on my laptop. Uh, okay, so it's called Thirst. Uh, water tastes holier at iftar, dulling a spike throat, an excuse for port de juid. It's not cheating if it's for wudu, slurped from the grail of two palms, gulped with air, a school of bubbles anchored. I force down a whole bottle, practicing compassion with my organs first. I fill a plant pot until the stem is bamboo on an island, sipped in threes, crumbs of breath, chewy kajul, samosa dragged in chutney. When the young ones pine for juice or coke, we tell them the syrup will leave spiders in their mouths. We tell them there are starving children across the world. Dehydration doesn't ring the same alarm as jagged abdomens, a chore of thirst. In Salah, the plasma rushes to my ankles, so quick the ground wavers. To be reorientated in Gibla, a worship in itself, close to fainting, closer to God, thirsty for the wall to talk back to us. Some look for patterns in the face of the cup to see the unseen, to know without instruction, known like swallowing with thirst the only necessary stimulus, untaught, a piping hot pan on a touch-starved neck, undoing the knots, gussel in the shameless hours, drinking cigarettes, swimming without chlorine scratching my sight. I slipped once, slid a whole nautical mile, held underwater in a headlock. The lifeguard rolls his eyes, almost drowned, but at least there was a wave machine in the good part of town. The ghost story of the knife and the water slide, the spring showers go unnoticed. Every morning a dry mouth. We forget to drink our fill. Maybe it's the Midlands in me, a thirst to be close to bodies of water or to exist in the shade of mountains. On nights like these, the main road sounds like incoming tides. The waiting cars come in waves under lilac clouds. Nothing is ever static. Not really. How's that one? Beautiful, man. Just, yeah, amazing. I've, I've absolutely, this half an hour has flown by. I've absolutely loved it. I, just such Thank beautiful you. work. Um, so, no, so. You. Your collection, where's the best place to buy it? Do you have any copies yourself or should we go do, further? As you know, it's probably better to buy from the author. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can, if you follow me on Instagram, uh, Camel and Poet, and uh, I've got I've got a few copies. So um, yeah, if you contact me, then I can send it to you. Um, 
or um, I think it's being sold on Amazon um, it's being sold on well the Verve site but yeah you're better off contacting me to be honest <laughs> direct, direct from you number one Verve number two nothing else yeah yeah, so that, yeah. yeah. well wait thank you so much for joining it's no, just been you. beautiful and I really look forward to reading it and checking out the illustrations about and seeing what you produce after this as well because it looks thank like you've you got so. tons of stuff yeah no thank you I, I'm looking forward to to see what happens in the next few months yeah cool well, take care. Thank you very much. You too. Take care. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. That was a truly beautiful set from Kim. Check out his collection, like I said. It's available through him directly or through the Poetry Press. Um, and join us next week. Uh, next week, I welcome El Emily Harrison to the Insta Sessions. Emily is a wonderful poet. Um, I've been lucky enough to share a stage with her a couple of times over the years. She won Best Spoken Word Performer at the Saboteur Awards a few years ago. Um, yeah, she's great. So join us next week, 7.30 to late. Um, follow us at Nymphs and Thugs. If you've got any poetry excerpts that you want to submit, have a look at our feed. I'm always sharing little excerpts from people. Just send us a DM. Um, and yeah, cool. Have a nice week. Cheers. Thank you.